Well, welcome to Brushy Fort Baptist Church. Sorry, I had to wrap my arms around my head and try to get that clip on. But uh, if you would turn to Revelation chapter uh, 5. Revelation chapter 5, while you're turning there, if you have any prayer requests or know of any needs in the community, you can uh, fill out that green card that's in the back of the pew. And uh, we will, uh, you can turn that in in the offering plate to, uh, either at the, the front door or at the fellowship hall door as we exit today. Or you can give that to me after the service uh, down uh, in the fellowship hall. Um, so uh, we are entering into the uh, Thanksgiving season. So we have much to be thankful for. And uh, Revelation 5 gives us the heart of why we should be thankful. Uh, and I think it will also um, uh, pave the way and, and uh, get us thinking about uh, what we should in light of Isaiah uh, 6 and 7, or Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 this morning. So Isaiah chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the others said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed for God, for every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and mind and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Let's pray. Father. We thank you for this day that you have given us. And Lord, we thank you for this mighty vision that you gave John in Revelation chapter 5. And, and Lord, the despair that begins the chapter, Lord, there is no one to take the scroll and open it. But Lord, that isn't true. Because Jesus has done everything required of him. He was able to stand up and he was able to take the scroll and he was able to open it. So Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that, that there is someone who is worthy. There is someone that, that has done all the, the requirements. There is, there is one who is righteous and he is our God. So Jesus opened that scroll, and Lord, uh, because of his ability to take that scroll and open it, Lord, he is worthy of all our praise. All of the earth, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So Lord, I pray that you'd be with us this morning, and Lord, that you would guide us, and Lord, that we would recognize that Jesus is on his throne, and Lord, that uh, we expectantly await that the day when he descends on that, right that white horse and 
Uh, he sets his kingdom up not just in heaven, but uh, he sets it up here on earth. When the culmination of his work started when he was born uh, in that uh, stable in Bethlehem. The Lord had ended when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, conquering death uh, on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the promise that is wrapped up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of the life he lived, because of what he has done, because of the, the promise he's fulfilled, because he was uh, he did what Adam couldn't do, Lord. He did what Abraham didn't do, Lord. He did what Moses uh, wouldn't do, and Lord, he was uh, able to accomplish what King David tried but failed. Lord, we pray that you would, uh, Lord, give us eyes to see, and Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us to take comfort in these trying times. In the fact that Jesus is on the throne. Uh, and Lord, we pray that, uh, that we would live in light of, of that truth. Lord, we would recognize that the words of Revelation 5 uh, are true. And Lord, they will be visibly seen as true uh, when that day comes when Jesus descends on that white horse. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, and we are going to look at verses 6 and 7. Uh, I don't know about you, but this week uh, you may have felt just a little bit discouraged with all the news and uh, news cycle that has uh, been going on. Uh, I want us to look at uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and uh, see that in times of political uncertainty, there is a comfort. There is a answer. Uh, 2020 has been a whopper of a year, hasn't it? Uh, we've uh, experienced a global pandemic, that which we haven't seen since uh, probably 1918. Or, uh, did I say that right? Yeah, 1918. Um, for some reason, when I said it, it did not sound right. Uh, then, uh, not only that, but all the unrest this summer, all the, the riots and uh, political unrest and, and the cities uh, on fire and, and all the turmoil that goes with that. Um, and it seems like all kinds of things have gone wrong. Uh, and it's easy to get caught up in all the negative problems that are around us. Uh, but let those negative things point us to the truth. Uh, even though the world will wane towards destruction, uh, but that only means that the day when that trumpet sounds and the sky splits open is one day closer uh, than it was before. Our Savior will uh, descend. In fact, Carrie and I were actually talking this week about 2020, and, and we hope that we can live to a ripe old age when we can talk to our grandkids, and as they're reading it in the history books, we can tell them exactly what it was like uh, to live through uh, 2020. Uh, but this morning, uh, we need to look at Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So let's look at that this morning. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of a peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. For this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. And Lord, we thank you that uh, it should be a great encouragement to us today because of the, 
the political unrest and the uncertainty that of the days that we live in, Lord, uh, these words by Isaiah should uh, drive truth home to us. Lord, that, uh, that the uncertainty and the negativity and, Lord, the, the, the anxiety that that brings, Lord, that doesn't have to be our focus. Lord, there is a, an overarching truth that, uh, that um, forever shadows the problems that we may be facing. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that uh, there is a new day dawning. And, and Lord, that that day will bring about eternity with Christ uh, as our King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, until that day dawns, Lord, we expectantly wait. And Lord, we recognize that, uh, that this world may seem like it's falling apart. And Lord, that the prophecies that that have been given, Lord, you expect us to, to understand that. Lord, we, we will hear about all kinds of evil things and all kinds of, of problems that this world is facing. But Lord, that just means that your plan is, is continuing at pace, and Lord, that you are still in control, and Lord, that we can trust and look to you. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, Isaiah chapter 9, 6, and 7 tells us, it points us to the fact that we are to look to Jesus, who has the weight of our government squarely on his shoulders. It's interesting. We know this passage of scripture because uh, we look at it probably practically every Christmas time. But uh, in Isaiah's day, this would not have been a Christmas message. Christmas had not come yet, had it? Now, in Isaiah's day, the problem that Isaiah was facing, the problem that Israel was facing, is what they is they didn't know politically what was going to happen to Jerusalem. Assyria had come up to the gates, and it looked like they were going to take the city. And, and the Lord, in his mighty uh, arm of power, drove them back miraculously. And then Babylon came, and they came to the city walls. And, and they are, uh, the city of Israel is expecting to be overtaken by Babylon. This is a, a time in, that Isaiah is writing in, in a lot of political upheaval. The city of Jerusalem doesn't know what is going to happen tomorrow. And Isaiah writes this as a comfort to them. And he tells them in verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The first thing that we need to look at, the first thing that we need to recognize if we're going to look to Jesus and see that he is the weight of the, the government on his shoulders is that when we feel anxious about the governmental uncertainty, of our world, we need to look to Jesus, the rightful governor of this earth. You see, uh, verse 6 starts out in a way that we probably wouldn't have felt very comforted by in Isaiah's time. Think about this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. We have the benefit of having Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where, where Matthew directly connects this to that baby that was born in Bethlehem. But Isaiah, he had no, uh, no uh, indication like that other than Isaiah chapter 7, where we see that there will be a child that is born and his name will be Emmanuel and he will be a sign that God is with his people. Other than that, uh, Isaiah was, was in the dark. So we have, a, we have a little more information than he does. But here, uh, Isaiah starts this prophecy. He starts this promise with a promise. For to us a child is born and to us a son is given. In fact, if we looked back at Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4, we would already see that Isaiah has proclaimed the fact that when uh, children are princes and when children are kings, things don't go well. And, and this would probably have rung on the ears of Isaiah's hearers as, as something confusing. But this has a great promise that is wrapped up in it. 
For to us a child is born, that is not necessarily encouraging. But these second words that highlight and, and emphasize what Isaiah is telling us, to us a son is given. Now the child being born, that's nothing remarkable, is it? It happens every day. But here, Isaiah points back to chapter 7. And to us, a son is given. This is the promise of the one Emmanuel. This is the God with us child. This is the child that is a sign that God has not left his people and that his promises are coming to fruition. Here, uh, if we have the world's eyes, we may be discouraged. But, but if we have the eyes of, of uh, a biblical understanding, we will recognize that, that Isaiah is telling the people that God's plan is coming to fruition just as he said it would be. And, and nothing has come outside of the plan of God. Not the fact that Assyria was going to take Jerusalem or was right there at the city gates. Not because Babylon is massing an army and coming for the city this time surely to take it. No, even that falls within God's plan. Because there is a son that is given. This son has the Davidic title. This son is the promised Messiah. This is the one that the world has been looking for. This is the one who fulfills the promise of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is the one that, that God gave the promise to Eve right after the fall, that there will be one, one of her children will come and he will crush the head of that serpent. That's the, the introduction to this promise. And then we see in the promise to Abraham that Abraham is, is promised that his descendants would be as uh, plentiful as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And that is really hard to number, isn't it? But then that promise goes on and says that his uh, children, this special child, will be a blessing to the whole world. And then the promise continues with Isaac and with Jacob and then with Moses. And we have the receiving of the law and wrapped up in this law is a training, is a pointing to the fact that all things are not right, even under the law. Moses didn't get it right. And the people of God didn't get it right. In fact, they struggled all throughout the Old Testament. We see that, that even King David, who, who the prophets spoke about him, who was one, who was a man after God's own heart, David didn't even get it right. But yet this child, this son, is the one who fulfills that promise that that, that kingdom will not leave the descendants of David. Jesus is the rightful heir of the kingdom of David and he will sit on that throne for all eternity. <laughs> for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Those are great and mighty words to those that have a biblical understanding, to those who have heard the promises of the Bible, because this means that God is bringing about his plan. And then notice how he comforts the Israelites in the second part of verse 6. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. If we are anxious today about the political situation we find ourselves in, look to this part. Because we have a promise, and we have a promise that recognizes that there is a kingdom that is greater than the one in which we reside. As great as America is, as thankful uh, that, we, that we are for the freedoms that we experience here in America, there is a kingdom that is greater than it. That if we know Jesus, then we are citizens of that kingdom. You see, Israel was facing a great political uncertainty. 
And Isaiah comforted them by telling them that this child, that this one that is coming, the son of God, this one is going to be the one whom the government shall be upon his shoulders. The problems that they were facing, the problems that they were encountering, the fears that they had, uh, Isaiah is telling them that God has the answer. If it looks like Jerusalem is going to be overtaken, if it looks like you're going to be sent into captivity, don't despair because God is not done. You see, there is one who is coming whose go who government shall be upon his shoulder. And this is a blessed promise. You see, this is a promise because countries have walls and they need walls because there is a sin problem that it abounds on this earth that is vast. But there is a kingdom that comes that will no longer need a wall. It will no longer need a border because the sin problem will be taken care of. And the kingdom shall rest on his shoulders. Jesus is the heir and proper ruler for the kingdom of God. A child king oftentimes brings rather uncertain times, doesn't it? Think about the time of, of Josiah in the time of Israel. He uh, received the kingdom at a very young age and fortunately for him, there were ministers that, that took over a great majority of the, the role of administering the kingdom until he was of age and responsibility where he could do it. A, a kingdom that is led by a child oftentimes goes into ruin. In fact, we know that because sometimes adults act like children and they drive things into the ground, don't they? Even an adult who acts like a child will run things among. But here, Isaiah is saying that this child will be unlike any other child. This child will be able to bear up under the responsibility of not just the government of this world, but he will be able to do it with perfect obedience. Jesus, as a child, is far better than any ruler we have ever experienced. Our current political reality only points us to the fact that we need a better king. We need a better system. We want to be free from corruption, sin, and injustice. And that is the heart of, the, of Israel. And that's why Isaiah continues on. And he said, his name shall be called. And this is the part that we, that we look to every Christmas and, and with great wonder and amazement. But I want us to consider this in light of the promise that the, the government shall be upon his shoulders. There are four titles represented here in the last part of verse 6. Wonderful Counselor. In fact, it is really hard to translate these titles from the Hebrew. If we were to be literal... This would be a wonder, a counselor. Uh, it is two terms that are joined together, and, and neither one is an adjective of the other. They are both equal uh, in their weight and in their, uh, in their importance. And this is significant because... Yes, Jesus is a wonderful counselor, but, but Isaiah is pointing to the fact that, that this child is a wonder. He is something that is awesome, something that brings great comfort to his people. And not only that, his counsel is true. This just drives home the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. The promised one that is coming, he will be a wonder to the world. He will confound uh, the wisdom of the world and they will look small in light of his wonder and his wisdom. And his counsel will not be broken. There will not be a problem that Jesus will not solve. There is not a, a, a problem of the kingdom that will come to this king who he will not have the counsel and the wisdom to address in purity and in righteousness and in justice. 
What an amazing promise. Then he goes to title number two. Translated mighty God in the ESV. And again, this is hard to wrap our minds around in the transition or in the translation. Uh, that word mighty literally probably would be represented with the word hero. Yes, God is mighty. But here Isaiah points to the fact that, that Jesus is someone that is looked at with superhuman characteristics. Isaiah talked about heroes before Superman and Batman and all the other comic book characters. Jesus is the one that we look at that has special capabilities. He has special um, abilities. He is our hero and he is God. Again, Isaiah wants to point to the fact that there will be there will not be a situation, there will not be a problem that Jesus can't handle. He is mighty God. He is our healer. And then he says, everlasting Father. We've had the privilege of, of seeing uh, both great increases in, uh, in our liberty and uh, in our country, and then we have also seen problems and trials and, and uh, poor times in our country. Here, Isaiah points to the fact that, that this king, he is an everlasting father. He is one that will last forever, and he is the one who gives us fatherly counsel. He is the one, and his kingdom will not wane and wax. His kingdom will be consistent. He's the father we can run to and he will be there and he will be consistent. There won't be a problem and there won't be a situation that, that uh, occurs that will uh, drive us down into despair. There will be a consistent and righteous king. He is everlasting from beginning to end. In fact, he has no And then the last title, maybe the most significant title. He is the Prince of Peace. So interesting because Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 3 connects this, this idea of a prince being a young child and being a detriment to the kingdom. But here, this prince of peace, he is the one who brings about the promise of God. He is the one who brings about peace. This child, yes, he is a prince, but he is a prince that will bring peace, the peace that we long for. It's not just the, the fact that there will be no wars, but everything will be set right. As we're going to see in, in Isaiah chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 65, all the tears will be wiped away. All the struggles will come to naught. Under the kingdom of Jesus, our king, we will not have any discouragement or any problem. He will be the prince that brings about peace. So when we get discouraged at our political situation, we should turn our eyes and hope to Jesus, our proper king. We can trust him. We can trust him because of these four titles. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. In fact, Jesus is everything we need right now in this moment. Joe Biden or Donald Trump will not save us, nor will they save our country. Only Jesus can because he holds in his hands and directs the hearts of kings. So Isaiah encourages us to put our hope in Jesus and be patient as we wait out the resolution of our political chaos. It will be resolved. Isaiah wants us to realize, just like the Israelites, when the political turmoil becomes discouraging, God has a plan. And God is on his throne. And God is at work. So secondly, 
Not only uh, do we need to, to look to Jesus or, or when we feel anxious about the government uncertainty because he is our rightful governor of the earth, but we also need to run from the person who promises utopia on this earth and run to the only real utopia, which is the kingdom of God. Look at verse 7. We oftentimes focus so much on verse 6, we lose sight of the promise that is given in verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Think about that. As anxious as you might be today because of the political circumstances that are here, the promise of Jesus is that the increase of his government, what does that mean? Well, that means that, that the justice of his government will have no increase. It will be perfect. The economy of his government will be perfect. There will be no increase. We will have everything we need. His righteousness, his justice, he will deliver all of those. You see, politicians are quick to promise utopia because it gets them elected. However, there is only one king who can bring about the fact that the increase of his government and of peace will be there forever. And who is that king? On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore. That king is King Jesus according to Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Jesus is the one who brings the increase of government. He brings the peace. He's the one who upholds justice. He's the one who brings righteousness. And all of this happens because of the zeal of the Lord of hosts. He is doing it. This is happening according to God's plan. Just like in the days of Isaiah, God knows exactly what is happening here today. And it is not a surprise to him. In fact, God is bringing forth his plan forevermore. And that leads us to consider what God's kingdom is going to look like. What does it look like to live in light of this king? Look at Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Listen to that. Jesus doesn't have to rely on visual and auditory censorship. He knows what is going on. Reality is his. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his of his loins. Don't we long for that type of leadership? And then he says in verse 6, he gives us the description of what this kingdom will look like. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie, lie down with the young goat. That doesn't happen here on this earth, does it? <laughs> you get a wolf and a lamb together, and there's lamb chops. You get a leopard and a goat together, and you've got some messed up goats. And the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Talk about peace. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord and the water as the waters cover the sea. This is a vision of the peace that Jesus brings. 
through the turmoil of what we experience, this is the promise that Jesus holds out. One day, everything will be set right. There won't just be any wars. There won't just be uh, all of these things that are trouble us. Everything will be set right. To the fact that the child can play with the cobra. That a wolf can lie with a lamb. What a promise we receive. When we look at Isaiah chapter 61, we also see the continuation of this promise. Starting in verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend. Your flocks foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 65, starting in verse uh, 17. He continues, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and our people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and a sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessing of the Lord and their descendants with them before they call, before they call I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the promise that Jesus holds out. Jesus holds out that his kingdom will be a kingdom that is at peace. So if you feel anxious today, Look to Jesus, who is uh, the King of kings and Lord of lords. If someone promises you utopia, run from their promise and run straight into the arms of Jesus, who provides a kingdom of peace. To be able to experience this peace, we have to have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, to, to have a relationship with him, we must know uh, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, uh, so let me share that with you uh, just sh shortly. Uh, before we get to the good news, though, you guys know we have to talk about the bad news. The bad news is that every one of us is a sinner. We all have fallen short of the kingdom of God. Romans tells us that. All have sinned and fall short of the kingdom of God. And the wages of that sin is death. The bad news is uh, that we are all sinners. But then there's also the worst news. The worst news is that even though we're sinners, we can't do anything about it. Uh, uh, the wages of that sin is death. There is no way in which we can bridge the gap. We have turned our back on Jesus. We have turned our back on God. And there's no way that we can bridge that gap. That's the worst news. God could have left us there, but instead he gave us the good news. The good news is that Jesus 
lived the life that we couldn't live. He was perfect. And he lived and fulfilled everything that God set out. And, and Jesus is the answer. He is the Son of God depicted in, in uh, uh, Isaiah 9 verse 6. He is Emmanuel, God with us uh, from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Jesus is the answer to this. He is the one who bridges that gap. So the good news is that Jesus came and he died in our place. But do you want to know the best news? Even though Jesus died in, in our place, that death can be applied to your account. Paul tells us uh, that if we confess our sins, that Jesus is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we too can be saved. So even though there's bad news, even though there's worse news, the good news is that Jesus has died in the place and the best news is that that death can be applied to your account. The question is, do you know Jesus today? Can you, in pureness of conscience, stand and proclaim that the promise of Isaiah chapter 9 is yours? Because apart from a relationship with Jesus, the best thing we have is the political uncertainty of this world. But if we know Jesus, everything is far much better. Do you know Jesus today? And if you know Jesus, will you look to him even in these uncertain times? Will you look to him even though maybe the election didn't go the way you wanted it to? Be encouraged. God is still on his throne. And Jesus is the one who government will rest on his shoulders. He is the one we look to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, uh, it is a Christmas passage. It is applied to the birth of Jesus. But Lord, it speaks to us today. And we thank you for that. And Lord, it is a great way to point us to uh, a time of thanksgiving. Lord, uh, we can't be thankful unless we know the blessing that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we may be able to uh, to feign some thankfulness, but Lord, we can't be truly thankful without realizing what Jesus has done on our behalf. So Lord, as we walk and move towards Thanksgiving, I pray, Lord, that the truth of Isaiah chapter 9 would, would be rooted deep into our souls. Lord, as the, the, week, as the days and weeks unfold, as uh, we uh, come to learn after uh, all the the litigation and, and hopefully by December 14th when the, uh, the state legislatures elect the electors that will go to the, the um, electoral college, Lord, uh, I pray that we will know the outcome of the election and Lord, that you would give us grace and peace through that time. Lord, that you would be with our country. Lord, that uh, we are so thankful for uh, even though it seems like everything's falling apart, Lord, for the rigidity of our system. Lord, uh, the founders made a way for these problems. Lord, we are so blessed to have a court system that will litigate these. Lord, uh, they will share uh, what is given in, uh, in discovery. Lord, we will not be hidden. It won't be hidden what, is, what has happened. If there's, if there's fraud, then it will be unearned. So, Lord, we thank you for all of, uh, all of these things. Lord, we thank you for the rigidity of our country. And, Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless America, no matter uh, what, uh, what happens uh, through the dis deciding uh, factors of, of the end of this election. So, Lord, I just pray that you be with us, comfort us. Don't let us be bogged down in discouragement, but, Lord, help us to set our eyes on Jesus. And Lord, our hope is not in uh, this government because it will fail us. But Lord, our hope is in the one who will show, shoulder all of government for all eternity. And he will be a just king. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. If you feel like the Lord is leading you to have a personal relationship with him, 
then let me just share with you the best news. To share with you the best news, I have to share with you the bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners uh, and we fall short of the glory of God. Paul tells us for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means that that relationship in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that Adam and Eve had, that they had, were in relationship with God, that means that our sins break that relationship. Just like Adam and Eve rebelled against God, we are sinners too and we rebel against God and that relationship is broken. That's bad news, but that's not the worst news. The worst news is we can't fix that relationship. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That means uh, the, what we have earned by our sin is death and we can't change that. That's depressing. That's hard. But God doesn't leave us there. Thankfully, he gives us good news, even amongst this bad news and the worst news. God gives us good news, and the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus came. He died on an old rugged cross. He, he lived the perfect life that God called us to. He died on our behalf, and, and Jesus offers us the free gift of eternal life. He offers us salvation. That's the good news, but the best news is that Jesus' offer can be applied on our account. We can know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We can have that relationship restored. How do we do that? We do that by faith. Faith is an odd word, but it simply means trust. I'm trusting that the seat that I'm sitting in is going to keep me off the floor. We have to place our faith. We have to trust that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he did. We have to trust that. And we have to trust that he will honor his promises, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We express that oftentimes by praying. So if you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to pray a prayer uh, something like this, where you uh, tell God that you recognize that you're a sinner and that your sins have separated and broken that relationship with him and to tell him that you're sorry and, and to realize that Jesus uh, came to be the answer. He came to, to die and to live the perfect life and to die in your place. And that you are accepting, you believe that Jesus did that. And you want his death to be applied to your account. You want the forgiveness of your sins. And you want to follow Jesus in obedience the rest of your life. If you've made that decision, would you reach out to us? Would you email us at info at brushyforkbaptist.com or contact us on Facebook? We'd love to hear that you've made a, a commitment to follow the Lord. God bless.